Good morning, church. Let's stand and worship this morning. May. Hallelujah. We believe in the sun. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of His blood. Amen. Amen. I'm alive. I'm alive because He lives. Amen. Amen. Let my soul. Jesus, our 
things. Welcome. I'm Pastor David. Before you sit down, turn around and say hello. Greet someone around you. Pastor David, Pastor David, you know how our kids have been having such a great time at camp? They, you know, there's, there's Luke and there's Seth and, and, and Gabby and, and, and Benjamin and Micah and Josiah. They all had this amazing time. And I was just sitting back there and I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could take our entire church family to camp? And give them an experience, like they could get a glimpse of how our kids experience the Lord. Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, Wesley, I'd love for everyone to, to come and see what the kids did all week long, but it's a three-hour drive. There's just no way we can bring everyone up there. That's a good point. That's a good point. I have an idea. We could make a video. Uh, I, I suppose a video. If we, if we had a video, that, that would help. James, do we have a video? Roll the video. <laughs> Super Summer was a great time. We got to worship God in exciting worship services, uh, good preaching, uh, fun activities all week long. My favorite part of the Super Summer Camp was the high ropes. They had these two ropes on the side of you so then you could hold it and walk across. When they wanted you to get down, they wanted you to fall backward and just let go. It's good, shaky though. I didn't expect it to, um, like, from here the ropes are closer than they actually are. Um, scary.
So the middle school boys thought it was funny pretty much all week to ding dong ditch my room like every five minutes. And then they knocked again, knocked again, knocked again. So I go to the door and they're like, oh, we're super serious. Luke said, I'm not sleeping in here. When there is an abnormally large spider the size of a hockey puck. Luckily for them, I stepped in. I was brave enough and killed it for them. Like I was killing the spider, it went under the, I was in the bathroom at first. And then it went under the cabinet. And then as I'm killing it, after I killed it, when it came back out, I looked at the door and I see Pastor David over there dancing, like celebrating. I'm like, where did you come from? He thought it was super hilarious that we had out, uh, went in and killed a spider. We, uh, we did a morning rally where we, where we worshiped. Kind of, uh, we, you know, we sang a few songs. So everyone's worshiping God, everyone's focused on God, so it's, a, it's always a special time. Normally, I don't get this much time to be with the Lord, but the camp is basically that. It's the purpose. So I, that's why I really enjoyed camp. For me, I remember camp as a uh, just completed seventh grade camp that week just put me in a whole different direction in life and my relationship with God. I, I told the students, I don't know if I would be a pastor today if it weren't for what God did in my life at that camp. We kind of had the job of like teaching all the new kids and that was kind of my favorite part of camp. Just teaching all the new people, like all the traditions we had over the years. But the main thing that stuck out to me was how to not distort his image and how to live um, very like a very holy life. God created us in his image and that we shouldn't distort him because he has made us perfectly. And so you don't want to distort his image because it makes it look like a joke. The worship time is always a, a special time at camp just because there's so many people packed in like such a, I don't want to say a small sanctuary, but it's everyone's packed in tight. There's 800, 900 people there. My favorite part about the camp experience was the worship. Everyone was very enthusiastic, energetic, and overall it was a very fun experience. The other thing that I really enjoyed and getting to know these girls, my niece got sick uh, at the beginning of the week. The other two girls, Abby and Verona, when they found out that she was sick, they would bring her food, they brought her a Gatorade, they brought her all these things, and they were taking care of her, and that meant a lot to me, so I really appreciated them for that. And this was a great week. I enjoyed seeing God working among the lives of our students. How was it? It was great. It was great, eh? Yes, our kids were great. Great week, good to be back. We had fun. I really liked that time we got to spend together. All right, well, I'm glad that you got to experience, uh, get to know our, our youth. Um, this is back to school week, and so we are going to uh, be praying for our kids, our teachers. Uh, we're getting ready to start Awana. Uh, we've got so much going on this week. Uh, Wesley, talk a little bit about what's going on today. Today, have you noticed any of our young people in swimsuits? Because we're celebrating back to school, and there's going to be food, there's going to be fun, and we want you to come. Uh, Wesley, is this just for kids, uh, families, or you know, is this for more? That's a great question, Pastor David. There is something for everyone. So whether you are thanking Jesus for back to school or you are grieving back to school, there is something for you to celebrate. So, Pastor David, I understand that there's some changes coming up, especially next week. Can you fill us in on the details and the schedule for next week? Very exciting. Yeah, sure. So this week, uh, we've just got so many things. Wednesday night is when Awana starts back up. If you haven't gotten your kids registered, do that right away. You can do that even this afternoon. Uh, we'd love to meet with you, talk with you more about that. And uh, so that's coming on. And then next uh, Sunday, just one week from today, is when we're starting our new 12 o'clock uh, heritage traditional service. And uh, for those of you who've been waiting for that, asking for that, uh, I've been looking forward to, to having that time with you. So that'll be 12 o'clock next Sunday. We'll still have uh, our, our regular service like we've been having at 1030 here. Uh, um, and uh, we're going to have uh, small groups at 930. Some of our small groups are going to shift a little bit. We're going to have signs out. I encourage you, if you haven't tried one of those small groups, it's a great time to jump in next Sunday. We'll have uh, greeters to help you find the right class for you. And we'll also have uh, Don's class will be moving to uh, 1030 time. For those of you coming to the 12 o'clock service, there's a small group for you as well at 
30. Uh, I want to um, just welcome you if you're visiting. I'm Pastor David, if I didn't get to say that yet. And we really do appreciate if you turn in one of these connect cards. It just helps us send you an email or text with some information about the church and give you an opportunity to start learning about how you can get connected with the church. So uh, you can turn those into any of the giving boxes after the service as you leave. um, And we would appreciate that um, very much. And uh, I was back in the baptistry last week, so I didn't get to, I was just kind of uh, figuring out how and when to say different things, and so I didn't get to this, but Jonathan uh, was uh, able to be with us last week to lead us in worship. He's back here again this morning. We're glad to have him uh, with us to lead us in this time of worship. Uh, um, why don't, Wesley, can you pray for us as we get back into our worship? Pray with me. Living and loving God, thank you for drawing us near to your presence. Lead us deep into your heart. Help us to feed upon you, upon your word, and, Father, to experience your life. We love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me, please. In his freedom I am 
Father, the Spirit, and the Son. We trust in Him this morning. Amen. And Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him. trust in you always 
you know, we know that you'll be with us to the end and ever after. We thank you this morning. We worship you this morning. And we trust in you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's not like it used to be when we were kids. The pressures, the expectations, the uncertainty. It seems like being young grows more difficult each year. And being a parent comes with an ever-increasing level of anxiety. God, as a new school year begins, we ask for your hand to rest on the shoulders of our children. May your presence be palpable, your wisdom accessible, and your glory undeniable. We pray you would guard their hearts, guide their steps, and keep them safe. As they walk the halls, may their eyes be fixed on you. When they're overwhelmed, grant them peace. And when they're uncertain, grant them understanding. Thank you for entrusting us with your creation. Now, as they go back to school, we entrust them to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, um, all you parents, teachers, kids, we are praying for you and uh, pray for God to uh, just use this year to help you prepare for the future he has for you, but also to um, live for him in uh, wherever it is that, that you are um, in school. Uh, this morning, we're going to get back into the book of Exodus. Uh, we left off in chapter 6. We'll be in chapter 7 this morning. We're going to uh, pick up the pace a little bit. We're going to uh, begin to work towards uh, the actual exodus, the leaving of Egypt, and make our way towards the Ten Commandments in the coming um, weeks. Uh, this morning, we're going to look at the plagues, though. We're going to look specifically at the first plague, the plague of blood, uh, but really I'm going to say some things to address uh, the first nine uh, plagues that happen uh, in Egypt this morning. And the big question that comes up when you read about something in Exodus like the plagues and you see how God is really making life very difficult and in some cases causing life to end. Uh, the fish this morning, the cattle, different animals, people even. The question that, that comes up the most often is why does it seem like God is so angry all the time in the Old Testament and yet he's all about love in, in the New Testament? And even to the point where some people think it's almost like there's a different God in the Old Testament and New Testament. And, and I don't really think that's the right question or the question people mean to ask because to me when I hear that question, honestly just the first thing that comes to my mind is, have you read the whole Bible before? Because the Old Testament has so many passages about the love of God, that he is a merciful God, that he is full of compassion, that he saves his people. Uh, in the Old Testament, we have verses like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, it is full of descriptions of God's love. And, and in the New Testament, God strikes down Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. Uh, God describes all the plagues some of them much worse than what are in Exodus that are going to come in the book of Revelation. Uh, we have more descriptions of the suffering of hell in the New Testament by far than in the Old Testament. Um, and, and so when I look at that, I think, no, actually God is a God of love and a God of wrath and justice in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. I, I think what people really want to ask is how do we reconcile those two things that run from beginning to end of the Bible, that God is a God who brings judgment on sin and sinners, and God is a God of wrath, but yet also we read that God is love, and that God so loved the world, and so how do we bring those two things together? That's what we're going to wrestle with as we look at uh, Exodus 7, beginning in verse 14. I'm going to read the first part of our passage uh, this morning. Verse 14 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. 
Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go, so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. Let's pray together. Dear God, I, we, I pray that you would be glorified before us today in this text, that as we read of your judgments, that we would be moved to glorify you, worship you, and put our trust in you, and to put our trust in Jesus as our only hope of salvation. God, I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Verse 18 says, The fish in the Nile will die. The river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. I don't know about you, but that would be uh, quite an inconvenience uh, if suddenly our water supply that we count on uh, to come into our homes, uh, suddenly we could not drink it. Suddenly we had to uh, try to figure out how we're going to even have access to drinkable water. Why would God do something like bring a plague like this and the subsequent pl plagues that will come on the Egyptians. Well, I think there are several phrases in these verses we've already looked at that we need to focus in on. The first is verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. The reason God sends the plagues is that Pharaoh is refusing to listen to the word of God. This is also to say he has a hard heart. He is not willing to consider that God is really the center of everything in this world, that all that we do should revolve around God, that we should turn to him to say, God, what is your will and plan for my life? And instead, Pharaoh says, no, I want to do what's right in my own eyes. I want to live as if everyone else is here to serve me. And because he's unyielding, God begins to bring the plagues. Verse 15, God tells Moses to confront Pharaoh. And that word confront tells us that this is going to be a way of approaching Pharaoh <clears throat> that is um, not just, will you please, please let the people go? But God is really willing to do something to get Pharaoh's attention. Sometimes we need something uncomfortable to get our attention, to get us to recognize truth. If we are living in blindness to truth, someone might have to do something to get in our face a little bit and confront us so that we will be awakened to the truth. When I was in high school, I think this st still happens. I haven't seen it lately, but uh, when I was in high school, mad, mad, mothers against drunk drivers uh, was... Uh, active in my area. They would do things to try to get people's attention. Uh, mothers against drunk drivers were mad, of course, because they have a child that has been killed because someone just was thoughtless one night and thought, what's the difference if I drive drunk? And it ended their child's life, changed the course of their life forever. And so they want to do something to raise awareness. And you can stand before a group of high schoolers and say, Hey, don't drink and drive. And you can say that again and again, but it doesn't always sink in. And so what MAD would do, and I saw this at my high school, they would get a wrecked vehicle where someone was killed by a drunk driver and the car is just totally smashed and they'd either have it donated or somehow they would get it and they would tow it to a high school and just set it right there in front of the main entrance to the high school um, so that you couldn't get to school that morning without driving past that car, and everyone would be wondering, what's that smashed car out there? And word would start to get around, someone died in that car because a drunk driver hit them. And it made everyone really uncomfortable. No one wants to be greeted first thing in the morning at a day of high school to see something like that and be confronted with that. But that is a powerful way to get a message across, to get people to wake up to the reality of something that you're trying to present. And God is trying to wake up Pharaoh. God, out of his mercy, is saying, let me do whatever I can to get your attention of who I am. And that's, that's ultimately what the plagues are about. Verse 17 tells us, this is what the Lord says, by this you will know that I am the Lord. 
By this you will know that I am the Lord. God sends plagues not because he likes seeing people suffer, not because he wants to make people uncomfortable, but because there is a powerful truth, and that is who God is that is worth even making us uncomfortable if it will cause us to change our hearts and turn to God and see what a great God and Savior he is. This theme runs throughout the Bible that God at times uses wrath out of his love for us because he wants us to see him and see who he is and see truth that we desperately need. And so in Romans chapter 1, Paul writes the same thing. In Romans 1.18, Paul writes, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. It is because we suppress truth because people in our culture, in America in the 21st century do, because Romans in the first century when Paul was writing do. We look at creation. We have every reason to believe that God is a glorious God worthy of all of our attention, all of and instead we turn the other way. And we say, no, thank you, God. I don't want to do things your way. I want to do things my way. And so God uses wrath as a way of getting our attention, of shaking us up to a truth we must know. Judgment throughout the Bible is there to reveal the glory of God. But judgment is also throughout the Bible as a way of freeing people from oppression. I want you to notice what our text goes on to say in verse 19 and following. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff, And stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. It's hard for us to to read that. I I do believe the water was actually turned into blood. It didn't just change color. It didn't, uh, you know, it wasn't just some kind of visual effect. It was something that smelled so bad. It was something that really grabbed their attention. And there's just blood everywhere. And we look at that and we think, you know, that is a great uh, scene written about, described there for a horror movie, even in um, our culture today. And we might wonder again, why would God do that? And uh, I believe that it has to do with freeing the Israelites from oppression. We look at this story as Americans and our sort of highest virtue today, what defines our culture as being virtuous, is tolerance. And by tolerance, we mean that we accept everyone, every belief system, every moral system, whatever your views are on a range of social issues, well, that's your view, that's your opinion, and it's as equally valid as anyone else's, and we just don't want to look down on, criticize, or suggest that there is one truth and everything else is under. No, everyone has their own truth, and we should just celebrate everyone's truth. And so, how could there possibly be A God who is judging people for what they have done. But if you experience oppression, as the Israelites did, year after year after year, and we started in the book of Exodus with the king of Egypt ordering that the babies, the boys of Israelite women be taken from them and put to death and thrown into the Nile River. And when you experience that and you feel powerless and there's nothing, you, you, you don't have any means, you don't have access to uh, weapons or anything where you're going to be able to stop this, what you're going to begin to do is cry out, God, do you see what's going on? God, why don't you do something? And year after year, the Israelites' question is not, God, how could you possibly pour out plagues and judgment on the Egyptians? Their question is, God, how could you possibly wait so long to do it? And we in America just often lose sense of how much suffering there really is and the need to have a God of justice. We, we had our moment, I, I think in some sense, um, we experienced uh, something like that in 9-11. And for the several days after 9-11, it was kind of like all that moral relativism 
just set that aside because we had a very distinct understanding at that moment that there was a need for justice. And it lasted a few days, and then we kind of went back to holding up tolerance and, uh, a, a, as the ultimate virtue. But imagine if month after month, year after year, you're experiencing things like that, oppression, terrible cruelty. You want God to be on your side. You want God to be mighty. You want God to be ready to act. You want to know there is a God who sees what is happening and is a God who cares about justice. The Egyptians thought when they threw babies into the Nile River, that the Nile River would just take care of it all, that the water would just cover it over, and that people could just forget about what was going on. People didn't have to see it. People didn't have to experience it. They didn't have to think about it. It was just, it was gone. It was done. It was over. And yet those Israelite mothers did not forget. And what God does here in turning the Nile to blood is he says, you thought the Nile River would just cover everything over and it would all be forgotten and no one would notice. But now the entire river is going to turn to blood to signify, to represent what really happened in that river, to bring to light the cruelty and wickedness that is the Egyptian empire of the time, that is what Pharaoh represents. And God says, I'm going to bring it to light, and I'm going to judge you, and I'm going to free the Israelites, my people. All through the Bible, God brings salvation through judgment. God judges, and people are saved. God judges, and he rescues his people. There is an element there where judgment is the means by which God saves people. And that message is even to us today. God, God uncovers what the Egyptians had been doing by turning the Nile River to blood. But as we look at how God is a holy God, and God is a righteous God, and God is a God who sees. That means that God is a God who sees what we do as well. That means there is a God who will uncover everything. Jesus says, there is nothing that is hidden that will not be disclosed. Uh, God says that there is nothing in all creation that is hidden from his sight. Everything will be uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. In other words, it's not just Pharaoh's sins that are uncovered in Egypt so long ago. Every one of us needs to know that God sees what we do. He knows what we do. He is a God of justice and holiness. There is an accounting for our sin. There is justice that is to come. And before we jump into that last part of the text, I, I want to just point out that in some sense, that's a good thing. In some sense, we should want that. And what I mean by that is imagine if God was not perfectly holy and righteous. Imagine if there was not a God who saw what happened and didn't know what happened and didn't care about what happened or that in some way he was a mixture just in part of good and evil. And there was no God governing the universe who was perfectly righteous and holy. Well, that would mean there'd be no hope that there is ultimately anything really good about this universe the pain and suffering that we go through, the evil that we see, the injustices that we see that happen on a daily basis, we would have to look at all of those things and say, well, that's just the way it is. Maybe there's a God. Maybe he sees some of it. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's good. Maybe he's not. Maybe we don't know. Maybe we're just here by accident. Maybe we just happen to be here and cruel, powerful people do terrible things to, to poor people and children, and everything else, and that's just the way it is, and one day we'll all be gone, and we'll all just cease to be, and all of the things that we see happening will be forgotten, and that's just how the universe is. It's a cold, dark, cruel place. But the idea that there is a God who created the whole thing, who is perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, perfectly good, sees what happens, will have a time to hold all sin to account, will bring judgment, well, that gives us hope. That gives us hope that there's reason behind the suffering that we see, that there is something good about the universe, that the universe is not just a collection of all the terrible things happening and then it will cease to be, but the universe is something heading towards something good, something right, and that is God himself, that God is at work to prepare a people who will glorify him and recognize his love and greatness and holiness forever and ever, and it will be good and it will be beautiful. And the only way that's possible is if there is a God who is perfectly righteous and holy and just and because there is a God like that that means he has to have wrath and judgment pointed at sin 
And that means he has to have wrath and judgment pointed not just at other people's sins and those out there, but at my sin as well and your sin. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, of the righteous, holy standards of God. And so what judgment does is it calls on each of us to change our hearts about God. I want you to see that in this last section, verse 22 through 24. It says, But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water because they could not drink the water of the river. And in this passage, Pharaoh, it says, did not even take this to heart. In other words, what God was seeking to move Pharaoh to do and what God knew he wasn't going to be ready to do yet was that Pharaoh would take to heart, that he would look at this judgment, that he would look at what was happening to the Nile River. He would take it to heart and he would do something differently, that he would change in some way. And so that's the message for all of us, that we must take it to heart. So we need to look a little bit about what does that mean. Let me ask, first of all, why did Pharaoh not take it to heart? And the one reason that the text gives before us at this moment is that the Egyptian magicians could do the same thing. And that is a theme that runs throughout the story of the plagues. In fact, uh, already earlier in chapter 7, Moses took his staff and threw it on the ground. And, and we read earlier that it turned into a snake. Actually, that word could uh, here probably be better translated crocodile. It turned into a snake in front of the Israelites. But when Moses did it in front of the uh, crocodile may be uh, the better translation there. Um, but then the Egyptians, their magicians, did the same thing. They threw their staffs on the ground and they turned into snakes or crocodiles. And Pharaoh said, see, I have priests, I have religious men that have connection to our gods. They can do the same thing. And I believe that the Egyptians could. I, I think that uh, the Bible is very clear. There are supernatural forces of darkness in the world. Uh, that there are different civilizations and people and times that have been able to uh, sort of connect with those powers. I don't think there's any reason why, given the experiences that people all over the world report, that, that we should question that or say, no, things like that don't happen. Uh, and I think we'd have every reason to think that the Egyptians at this time did have religious figures that could tap into some of that supernatural power of darkness and could do some very powerful things. But here's what happens with those crocodiles on the ground. Moses' crocodile, the one that came from his staff, swallowed up all the others. And what happened here in the Nile River is uh, almost certainly that, that they turned some water into blood. But the Bible's telling us that Moses, when he held out his staff, the entire Nile River turned to blood. And plague after plague, God's power will prove to be superior to the power of the Egyptian gods. In fact, you could describe all of the plagues as being God demonstrating his power over all the other so-called gods, over all those other powerful supernatural beings. Roman, uh, Exodus 12, verse 12, God says, I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. And so God begins with Hopi, the god of the Nile River. He says, I am actually in charge of the Nile River, not the Egyptian god Hopi. He goes on to take on the god of frogs, Hecate, and says, Egyptian god Hecate, you're not in authority. The frogs I will send all over the land, and they'll go away when I tell them to go away. God goes on to take on the god of uh, Apis, and then Set, the god over wind and hail. God says, I'm in control of all of these things. God even brings darkness over the Egyptian god Amun-Re. He covers up the sun and puts darkness all over the land. And God says, I am the god over all gods. And so Pharaoh would get the message again and again and again. You might think you have control over this world and how things go and that you know how to run things according to your desires and your plans and everything is there to serve you. But all of those gods you trust in, I'm the one who actually rules over everything. And God's message is the same to us this morning. He wants us to take it to heart. Do we have our own uh, things that we think we have control over, that we want to live for? Absolutely. 
Uh, in our culture today, it is very common, very common, that even those who would identify as a Christian or say, I believe in God, really you have God sort of neatly tucked away into one compartment of your life. And you live most of your life without concern about who God is. Occasionally, yeah, I'll go to church a few times a year because, you know, I, I believe in God and I know I need to go to church some. Uh, I'll think about eternal things when I'm at a funeral from time to time. Uh, when things are really bad, I might turn to God in prayer. And so at different moments in life, I might say, yeah, yeah, I need to turn over and look at that section of my life where I have a little bit of religious belief in God. But to think that my whole life is to revolve around God, to recognize that God is the one who gives me life and that all that I am uh, comes from him and that everything that I do only finds purpose and hope and meaning through him and therefore I should go to him continually and say, God, how do you want me to live? How have you designed me? How have you made me so that I can experience what you have made me for as being one in the image of God? That is not common in our culture today. And God, again, I believe, uses judgment at times to grab our attention, to wake ourselves up to that truth. Uh, for most people, it is not right to say, hey, everyone, pay attention to me. If I came up at the beginning of the message and just said, hey, everyone, I want you to know how wonderful I am. Let me just walk you through all the greatest achievements in my life. And, and just I want you by the end of this message today to think, wow, Pastor David is just the greatest person. If I preached a message like that, I, I, I hope that, that you would stop coming back if, if that was the, the routine week after week. Uh, that, that, that would really be uh, troubling if I were to do something like that. But God does that. Again and again and again, he uses wrath and judgment and mercy and salvation to say, look at me, look at how great I am, pay attention to me. And when God does it, he's the only one who can do that and it'd be right. And it's right because he is the only perfectly righteous, holy being. And it's only when we look at him and are captured by his beauty and his holiness that we can have hope that there is something good in the universe and that when God made us in our image that that, that God loves us and that there is something worth living for and that there is someone worth pursuing and we can find peace and joy and hope only in him. And so it's right for God to say, hey, stop ignoring me. Stop pushing me over into the corner. Look at me. Pay attention to me. And God uses even judgment to do that. He uses that here, and yet Pharaoh did not even take this to heart. My question this morning is, what would God need to do for you to begin to take it to heart? What does that even mean? Uh, I consulted with a good uh, definitive source on what things mean this week. Uh, I searched for take to heart in Urban Dictionary. And sometimes they give some interesting definitions just that connect with our culture. And, and uh, I think they gave a good one here. The Urban Dictionary used an illustration for take it to heart. And the illustration was they said there's uh, someone complaining about teachers. Uh, and the teacher says, or the person says about teachers, teachers are just always wasting so much time. And there happens to be a teacher there that hears this. And the teacher says, what are you talking about? I've been working all day long. I haven't taken a single break all day. To which the person responds, don't take it to heart. I didn't mean you. In other words, don't let it trouble you. Don't let it bother you. Don't, don't, don't think that it's something that you should consider and, and get kind of wound up over. You, you don't need to worry about it. it wasn't, I wasn't talking about you. And, and I think the same thing here is true. When, when God does something in your life to get your attention, when, when you experience suffering, when you experience mercy and grace, when you experience his creation, will you take it to heart? Meaning, will you let it get in and bother you and say, you know, I... I have not followed God like I should. I have sinned against a holy God's commandments. I have done things that I know are displeasing to God. I have not lived as one bearing the image of God like God created me to be. And, and as you think about that, does it trouble you? Do you take it to heart to the point where you cry out, what must I do to be saved? And the answer the Bible gives to that question also has to do with God bringing salvation through judgment. You see, the ultimate judgment, the ultimate example of God pouring out wrath in history 
was nothing that he did to the Egyptians, not even the slaying of the firstborn, not the flood, not Sodom and Gomorrah, not any of those things. The greatest example of God pouring out his judgment was when he gave his one and only son to die on the cross. In that moment, God again brought salvation through judgment. God poured out all the judgment that we deserve on one who is perfectly righteous, that our sin might be paid for, that God could maintain in some way his perfect holiness and righteousness. He doesn't just look away from sin. He doesn't just ignore it. But he is a holy God who burns against sin. And he said, yes, but I love my people that I have created. And so I will pour out my wrath and my judgment on Jesus in order that I can maintain my perfect integrity, holiness, and righteousness. And yet the very righteousness of Christ can be given to those who trust in him. This morning, as we have a time of response, I'm going to lead us in a prayer in just a moment. And I want you to consider, do you trust him? Have you put your trust in Jesus as your only hope, as your savior? What Jesus did on the cross was to display his judge, was God to display his judgment, was God to display also his love. And if you're waiting for anything to take to heart, take to heart what Jesus did on the cross for you and your sin. That he was willing to do that, to display both the wrath and justice of God and the love of God at the same time. And God calls on you to look at the cross and look at your own sin and simply respond and say, I trust him. Will you stand together as we prepare to pray? Stand with me. There are, there are uh, Sunday school teachers, deacons taking their place around the sanctuary. If you need to pray with someone this morning, if you say, you know, I need to make some changes in my life. I need to take it to heart. I, maybe I, I need to come to put my trust in Jesus for the first time. You can slip out from where you're standing at any moment from, from here on and just find one of those around the sanctuary to, to pray with. They'll lift you up. I see some in the back one up here. Dave is up here. Uh, and, and we would love to pray with you, talk with you uh, about anything going on in your life. But uh, for the rest of us, let's just join together in a word of prayer at this time. Dear God, we do thank you that you are a God of justice. With all that goes on in the world, you are not just a God who does not care. You are not just a God who doesn't see. You are a perfect, holy, righteous God. And God, even in all the midst of that, we know that means your righteousness, your holiness will rightfully fall on us for our sin. But God, we just turn to you and praise you that you are a God who displays salvation and judgment. Even at the cross, you display your love for us and your holiness through the cross of Jesus Christ. And so we worship you. We thank you. We just simply want to turn to you and say, we trust in you, Jesus. We, maybe for the first time, maybe for the 750th time, we want to say, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Will you join with me this morning? Let's sing together. Tis so sweet. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. says the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him Jesus, oh, for grace to trust in Lord. Amen. We're so glad you came to worship with us this morning. Let me just remind you to collect our offerings uh, and those Connect cards. And any decision you want to make to share with me this morning, you can put those on the Connect cards too and just turn them in at the boxes at any of the 
doors as you leave. Uh, we're going to begin our back to school celebration immediately, so I ask you please uh, stick around with us. Just uh, You can come out these doors and take a right, or you can go out the back and come around. And inside the fellowship hall, we'll have all the hot dogs and, and the food in there. We'll have snow cones outside. Uh, uh, a lot of different games outside. We'll have different games for adults inside the fellowship hall over here as well. And I'd love just to have the chance to make my way around this afternoon, get to know some of you that I haven't been able to connect with very much, and hopefully a great time of fellowship of us just getting to know each other. So we, I, I hope that you stay, that we have a good time. Let me just pray to bless that time and that food, uh, and then we'll be dismissed. Dear God, I thank you so much for this time to worship together, and uh, we do pray you bless this food, this time to celebrate, uh, and we do pray for all our students, teachers, God, that, that you would just be with us throughout the year uh, in seeking to honor you in all that, that we do, and that, that you would just do great things through our students this year. God, we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right.